Hi guys, welcome to another video. Today's topic is one of the questions that I see the most online, and it's also one of the questions where I see the most misinformation. So I decided to make a video. It's actually a very simple topic, and the topic is, do I need to have a part 107 remote pilot certificate to do X? And we'll talk about X and all the different scenarios that we find online. The question is, do you need to have a remote pilot certificate, which is the commercial drone pilot certificate, or can I fly as a hobbyist? And there's, a, again, a lot of misinformation out there, and I wanna clear up some of the stuff. Now, I'm not trying to pull some of this stuff out of my, you know, where. I'm trying to give you the information as it is given by the FAA. So what I have is actually I have sources, believe it or not, that are gonna give you some of that information, and you can check the information yourself, so you can verify that what I'm saying is actually correct. So. So there are four things that I wanna to cover today in this video. And the first one is the differences between hobbyist and remote pilot, okay? And we'll talk about remote pilots first. And then I'm gonna answer the question, do I need a remote pilot certificate? And then I'll give you a bunch of scenarios. And then also I'm gonna answer the question, can I still fly as a hobbyist if I'm a remote pilot? And this is a question that I see online uh, quite a bit and the answer is pretty simple. And then the last one, which is also something that gets a lot of misinformation is, can I get paid as a hobbyist? And you'll be surprised with the answer. So let's get going. Let's talk about hobbyist regulation. Now hobbyist regulation, as I'm recording this in June of 2019, has recently changed. Now it used to be part of section 336, which was also um, part 101. It has been replaced by section 349 under the FA re reauthorization Act of 2018. Now the FAA did the first batch of changes. There's actually a video that you can take a look at. I'm gonna put it right here in uh, that little tag thing on YouTube. So you can see uh, all the details in, in, in way more detail than I'm gonna cover in this video. But section 349, just remember this number. Now, the regulation for section 349 actually lives under 49 in the US code uh, 44809, which is title exception for limited recreational operation of unmanned aircraft. I know that's a mouthful, but that's basically where it is at the moment until it becomes federal aviation regulation by the FAA, which I'm assuming is gonna replace the old part 101. Now there are eight things at the moment that will qualify you as a hobbyist and you have to meet all of these requirements and if you don't then you're not flying as a hobbyist and these, these, these eight things, some of them have changed recently, some of them have not. And the very first one is pretty basic. And it says that you have to fly for recreational uses. Now this is the key to this entire video kind of, you have to fly for recreational purposes. The second bullet point in here is that the aircraft has to be operated in accordance with the, what we call the programming of a community-based organization. Now this is a point that, again, as of June of 2019, the FAA is still working on, so I'm just gonna skip on that one. The third one, this has always been in place, section 336 or uh, section 349, which is the aircraft has to be flown within visual line of sight. Again, remember all these requirements have to be met. And then you have to operate the aircraft in a manner that gives way to other manned aircraft. You have to be safe flying other people and you have to play nice in the airspace. Number five, you have to get approval in order to fly in controlled airspace. Now this was the major change that the FAA did with section 349 that wasn't in section 336. But again, this is one requirement that you have to meet and controlled airspace is um, Alpha, Bravo, Charlie, Delta or Echo airspace in the United States. Number six, the aircraft is flying flown from the surface to no more than 400 feet above ground level in uncontrolled airspace, okay? This is also something that's somewhat new to section 349. Number seven, the operator has passed an aeronautical uh, knowledge and safety test. Now, this is something that is also not in place as I'm recording this, but it is in the regulation. It's something that's gonna be uh, coming up very soon by the FAA. And then the last one is the aircraft is registered and marked appropriately based on the regulation. Now, if you meet all eight of these requirements, then you are flying as a hobbyist. Now, with that being said, Key number one, you are flying as a recreational pilot. This is kind of the big deal. And this is really what hobby means. And if you look in the regulation in section 336, which is, I know has been replaced by section 349, but if you look in the, there's a document out there and I put a link in the, in the, doc, in the, in the comment section of this video. 
there is an interpretation of section 336. Now, the interpretation is what is a hobbyist, and that hasn't changed between 336 and 349, so you can continue to use that interpretation right here. And you can see the definition right here. They're basically saying that what you're doing is you're doing for relaxation, you're doing it for fun, okay? This also is highlighted in the document. It says it does not apply to persons or companies that are for business purposes, okay? Business purposes, that's kind of a key point right here, kind of a keyword. The next thing that you'll see in this document, it says that any operation not conducted strictly for hobby or recreational purposes does not fall under Section 349. It actually falls under Part 107, which is where the remote pilot comes in. It also says in here that any flights that are in furtherance of a business or incidental to a person's business do not qualify for hobbyists, do not qualify for the rules in Section 349. Now, I want to make a special point here. If you read in the entire document, you're going to see that at no point in time there is anywhere where money is actually mentioned. There is no mention of money being exchanged. There is no mention of whether you're flying for a specific outfit like a church or non for profit. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the intent of the flight, the intent of the flight. And you're going to hear people that actually know what they're talking about. They're answering your question by saying it doesn't matter if, it, if money is being exchanged. What really matters is the intent of the flight. So here's a very simple diagram. Are you intending to fly for your own enjoyment for recreational purposes. If the answer is yes, then you're safe. You can go ahead and follow section 349 and follow the rules and regulation under that section. If the answer is no, then you need to receive a remote pilot certificate under 14 CFR part 107. It's really that simple. Now you're going to say, well, what if I don't get paid? You're going to say, what if I'm doing this for a non for profit? What if I'm doing this for a church? And you're going to say, what if I'm doing it for my monetized YouTube channel? Well, the answer to all of these is the same. You do have to get a part 107 certificate because now think about it. You're not going up there to do this for enjoyment purposes. You're not doing this for fun. As soon as you step that line across that line, then section 349 no longer applies. You need to have a remote pilot certificate. That's it. That's really the answer to your question right here. Now, let's talk about remote pilot regulation. As a remote pilot, if you're not operating under Section 349, you are operating under Section 107. And there are a set of requirements as well that you need to meet. And these requirements are actually getting closer and closer to the requirement in Section 349. The big difference is, are you flying for fun or are you not flying for fun? And that's really the bottom line. In order to become a remote pilot, you need to pass a written exam and you need to receive a remote pilot certificate from the FAA. It's going to be valid for two years. And I have a course actually that I'm going to put in the description that you guys can follow. I've helped thousands of people at this stage. Actually, I've helped almost 4000 people get their license. And, um, and the course is 12 hours long and you'll get a ton of information, way more than you just need to pass the test. This is not what I believe in. I believe that uh, you need to know more than what is just on the test. So that's what the course cover. Anyway, side note, let's talk about the difference between a hobbyist and part 107. What can you do as a hobbyist? What can't you do? And what can you do as a part 107? And you'll be surprised. There are actually a lot of similarities. As a hobbyist or as uh, you can fly for recreational purposes, we just, talk, we just covered this. As a remote pilot under part 107, you can fly recreationally if you want, or you can fly commercially, which means that uh, you can do all the things that were not included in section 349. Also, as a hobbyist, you do need to meet the requirements and follow the guidelines under the CBO. I've talked about this, the FAA is still working on that point. As a remote pilot, you need to follow the regulation in part 107. And there is quite a bit of information. If you take my course, I go over all the different stuff in here. Both of them, hobbyists or remote pilots, need to get approval to fly in controlled airspace. At the moment, the FAA doesn't really have anything in place for hobbyists to do this, but it's coming hopefully in the next couple of weeks uh, this summer of 2019. As a hobbyist, this is one of the biggest difference still at the moment is that night flying is okay for hobbyists without any kind of approval. With the part 107, you have to get approval. Now, obviously, as a hobbyist, you're going to have to fly outside of controlled airspace if you're going to fly at night and be careful when you do this. As a hobbyist, you do need to get approval. You need to get a waiver in order to do this. Now, my feeling is very soon the FAA, when they get with the CBOs, they're going to nick that and, and basically you won't be able to fly at night anymore. That's just my, my, my gut feeling. I don't know that for a fact, but we'll see what happens. 
Under both of these cases, hobbyist or remote pilot, you have to fly below 400 feet AGL. Pretty straightforward. You also cannot fly over people and you also can't fly beyond line of sight. Okay, and the last one is very simple. You cannot fly over any kind of emergency vehicles and, uh, and, and be in the way of people, firefighters. I just had a video on this uh, last week talking about not, fi not flying uh, over uh, forest fires. So that's common to all these things. So you can see the list is actually fairly close at this stage. And uh, other than the night difference and the fact that one of them you have to take a test and the other one you really don't at this stage, um, then that's really the only difference. The last thing I want to talk about is the registration. I also have a full video talking about this. You can check it right here uh, in the uh, little tag. The difference is as a hobbyist, you get a registration and it's valid for all the drones that you own. As a remote pilot, you have to register each of your drones individually. It's only $5 for each drone under part 107. It's only $5 as a hobbyist for the overall thing. Again, you can check more details by looking at the, at the other video that I have. The next question that I hear a lot is, can you still fly as a hobbyist even though you are a remote pilot? And the answer is yes, you can, absolutely. You just have to decide before you take off which rules you are going to follow and you also can change the rules in the middle of a flight. It's really that simple. And finally, the last question that I hear all the time is, can I get paid as a hobbyist? And most people will tell you, no, you can't, because most people think that money being exchanged is a key to whether you need a hobbyist or a remote pilot certificate or you don't. And the answer is yes, you absolutely can get paid as a hobbyist. Now there's a caveat to this. And the, uh, I'll give you an example to, to kind of illustrate what I'm talking about. Let's say that you were flying for fun over a lake and at the bottom of a mountain, and then all of a sudden you capture a landslide. It's really cool. You put it on YouTube, all your friends start to share it, and then all of a sudden a local TV sees it and they say, hey, I wanna get that footage, I wanna pay you for the footage. Can you accept payment even though you're only a hobbyist? The answer is yes, you can, absolutely. Because the original intent of the flight was to fly for fun. You just happened to capture something that was newsworthy and you can actually make money off of it. Now be careful with this. The FAA is not stupid and they will know that um, they will find a way to get you if you're trying to go and go around this, this rule. Now, the reason I'm saying this is let's assume that you are a remote pilot. You have a business of taking videography, photography, and um, one night, because you can only fly at night uh, without a waiver as a hobbyist, you decide to fly as a hobbyist in uncontrolled airspace and you get some really cool footage, okay? and you decide that you want to sell it. Now, the FA might look at it a little bit differently and they might say, well, you decided to go up, you knew that you were going to sell this footage if it was good, so this falls under, um, under, under part 107 and you need to have a waiver for this kind of operation. So be careful. Again, be reasonable, understand the spirit of the law and make sure that when you make a decision, you can explain it to the FAA or in front of a judge or like I always tell my students, in front of the eight o'clock news. Whatever decision you make, these are the three kind of organizations that you're gonna to have to report to if you do something stupid. If you wanna check the information I gave you or if you wanna read more about it, I invite you to go to these sources right here. The first one is the uh, exception, the full rule right here for the new section 349. And then the second link right here is the inter interpretation of the special rules under section 336, which again, for the section that we discussed in here is the same as uh, section 349 that hasn't changed. If this was helpful, please share. This is the kind of information that we need to share. We need to stop giving false information to people about whether you need a remote pilot certificate or whether you don't, okay? Also, please subscribe to this channel. I've got way more videos coming up, including all the weekly updates that I'm doing at the moment. And um, if you have any questions, as always, please leave them in the comments and uh, I'll be happy to help you. All right, have a good day.